Dirty Owl Hug. I am sad to announce that I am out of both tea and coffee. I expect my demise to arrive at some point during this dream I'll rook for Edmund. At long last, I am liberated from the confines of the womb.
Hello, Owlet. And otherwise. Ah. <sighs> You know, I'm a little tired, a little out of it. I'm sure I'll come out of it during stream, but I definitely feel good. Yesterday, I had to leave stream early because I got fit in for a tooth cleaning. I think I might be one of the only people ever who has gone to the dentist and gotten the news back that my gums are healthier. <laughs> I, I feel like usually the dentist says, oh, you gotta floss more, right? That's, that's the meme. No, I, I went in and they said, oh, your gums are looking good. Everything, the way she put it was great. It's what... Everything is within normal parameters, I believe she said. I was apparently among my kind. Nerdwolf, I mean, it's more because I do floss every day. Little trick for all of you. If you dislike flossing... I have a trick for you. If you're having trouble doing it, try doing it in the shower. That's what I do. Because I always hate, you know, getting get, getting mouthy juices all over my my fingers when I'm when I'm flossing. It, it always happens a little bit. But you do it in the shower, and it's like, oh, it's right there. It's easy to do, and you can do it while you're uh, while you're in the comfy warm water. I would like to say that I flossed reg reg regularly before them, but um, that uh, was not the case. <laughs> but as soon as I started doing it in the shower, I actually started flossing regularly. I swear, give it a try. Mouthful of soap. I'm not do what I'm, I'm not washing my body and then also having floss in my mouth. It, one thing at a time. What do you tend to just do multiple things at the same time? Can are you incapable of doing one task? So you're a coward. I swallowed shampoo. I'm probably gonna die. It smelled like fruit. That was a lie called the number on the bottle. Spoke to a guy. Oh my god, I forgot to pre-pet again. He said vomit. I said why. He said poison. I said goodbye. I look at my finger. I look at my life. It wasn't that much. I'll probably be fine. I swallowed shampoo. I'm probably gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> Am I a little loud? There we go. That's good. <laughs> Kodiak, I, I had a friend make that same joke to me. Yeah, my morning routine, I, I wake up, salute the flag, take a shit, get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Fred, are you aware of the glorious instrument, the Horn of Geddon? Isn't that the... Oh, I don't want to mix it up. It's, um... It's a horn from the... I don't want to offend anyone. Um, the, the islands off to... On, on the western side of Europe, yes? The war horn. It is... Intense. It is an intense sound. I love war instruments, except for the timpani. Is that it? The 
uh, the American military um, marching drum. That's the car. Oh, okay. that's a Carnix. Thank you. In that case, no, I am not aware. There. Okay, I want cozy music. We do have... We, we do have a story lined up. I... When I was getting a PDF of the story to read today, I discovered something delightful. I've talked about this story a few times, and we'll get to it eventually. But I, we've talked about this story a couple times, Liar by Isaac Asimov, which is sort of the origin story of Susan Calvin. You might have heard me complain about the iRobot movie, like getting really pissed off about it, especially about the portrayal of Susan Calvin, who is cold and unfeeling and brutal. And we get her origin story in, uh, in Liar. Yeah, I remember you shot people over it. Yes. Exactly. <sighs> but thank you, Periseki, for the 16 months. And Cogfather for the nine, congratulations on escaping the womb. Pleco, Pleco for the 500 bits, thank you. Chill, thanks for the 20 months. And three Nazu for the eight, thank you very much, all of you. What's Fred doing today? Well, today we're reading a story, uh, one of which I am quite fond. I enjoy Isaac Asimov's robot stories because they all are, in effect, logic puzzles and it's really fun to see if i can figure it out by the end of the story before the end it's always very clever and then i after i'm done with stream it's going to be it's going to be a work day today. I'm catching up. I'm still playing catch up. My days right now, uh, I, I don't really get weekends right now. My days... Ask, how has the timpani wronged you? I thoroughly enjoy its placement in many classic pieces. Am I... I'm thinking of the wrong... I'm thinking of the wrong drum. I, I do like the timpani. I was thinking of the snare drum. I know what I was thinking of. I hate snare drums in marching bands. I don't know. They they work. They work in a drum kit, but I don't like the way that they're used in marching bands. That's what I was thinking of. Very impressive the way that some people play it, but not big on the sound. It's kind of hard to enjoy it and and enjoy the cap the the capabilities of the player when the sound itself is grating <laughs> but yes right now i'm kind of i'm at a point where i i don't really have weekends right now my days in general look like this um wake up morning routine stream lunch maybe and then just general work tasks until 9 p.m. And then I go to bed, and then I wake up and I stream. <laughs> and that's kind of my life right now. See, the thing is, Kippy, I don't know that I can afford it. I don't know that I can afford that time. Hey, Jordan. Welcome, M. You know, waves in reverse, that would be the ideal. Uh, I, I would not mind having Foxhole as a part of my daily routine. However, I cannot afford it right now. Yeah, I, 
I really properly cannot afford it right now, though. Once I'm caught up, maybe I can take weekends again. But right now... Totoro, I will say I am quite blessed to be able to have the job that I do. You know, the jobs, plural. <laughs> I do a lot of things, but I... I will say that being a content creator is not a job for everyone. I notice a lot of people... I almost want to say fetishize it. People decide that it's their dream job, and they'll do anything to get it, at, uh, whereas most of the people who are content creators sort of stumbled into it. Yeah, people idolize the job. And speaking as someone who does it, let me... There is a paradox around being a content creator. In order to be a content creator, you have to be a self-starter. You have to be self-motivated in a way that is, I would say, relatively uncommon. However, the paradox is that most people who are self-motivated tend not to know when to stop. And they just keep going. I am definitely of this ilk. I... For the first five years of Down the Rabbit Hole, I've, I've been public about this. I, I did nothing but Down the Rabbit Hole and I burnt out. It's why content creators burn out so frequently. It's not because the job itself is demanding, though it is. It's because we often don't know how to take breaks. And it's not healthy or sustainable. Mm. Now again, I, I feel very privileged to have the job that I do. But I will say, it is not for everyone. Only a very small number of people, I would say, are actually cut out to do it long term. I have had to learn. Well, Dan, I'm, I'm in a position where I, I have too much. I, I have obligations. That's my problem, is I, I have obligations. Once those obligations are fulfilled, then I can justify taking a break. Freb gatekeeping? No, Freb warning. <laughs> this is this is not gatekeeping. I, I'm not trying to gatekeep anyone. If you want to try for it, go ahead. But don't feel ashamed if you realize it's not for you. It is it is wisdom to recognize when something is not for you. And I think that too many people decide that they are to be a content creator, period, full stop. Ah, Dan, I'm a big boy. I'll, I'll be okay for a little while. Yeah, Totoro. Um, you, I would say that that is extremely accurate. Yeah, every kid wants to be a YouTuber, but the realities of the job are not immediately apparent. Marco, I, I just, I just can't justify it. I, I just cannot justify taking time off right now. Fred is using his platform to eliminate future competitors. <laughs> I think that it does take perseverance, but finding the difference between persevering to achieve and recognizing when effort is misplaced is difficult. 
It's how you end up with so many content creators pushing and pushing and pers pushing and destroying themselves. Kippy, I think I'll be able to. Um, it's a lot of small tasks. If I work hard, I should be able to actually take a weekend next weekend. <laughs> oh, hey, Rev fanboy. And I saw a few other new names as well. Welcome in, everyone. I, I hope you're all well. <laughs> Alamin, that's the thing, is I am locked in. Yeah, Cogfather, I think you're right. It is, content creator is a trendy dream job. Speaking as a content creator, it is, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just peculiar though, because I'm... I remember getting 1 million subscribers and it didn't really leave much of a mark on me. It didn't feel like an accomplishment. A million felt arbitrary. On the contrary, it I, I knew that people would see the million subscriber number and they would start expecting things from me, specifically view counts on every video. I guess. Then again, I've met some very impressive people and I've never been impressed, if that makes sense. It... I don't know. I, I've met... I've met a lot of people. And... I just... I, I don't get it. I just am incapable of being intimidated anymore. Like, I've never looked at... I've, I've been around some phenomenally important people in culture. In culture, in business, right? Like, I, I've met people and I don't know I looked at them and I just they're just people they're just people I think that I'm uncommon in this way. I I definitely don't feel this way because I am some YouTube big shot. Because I'll let you in on a secret. On YouTube, people aren't fans of me. They're fans of down the rabbit hole. They're f and this is by design. I want people to be attached to the series, not to me, on YouTube. Hey, you um. Yeah, yeah, you get it. I think that more has to do with my paradigm than my position. Olivine, you mean you don't have a hero? Clearly, you're broken. <laughs> that is kind of... It's a... Not, I, I guess it can't really be a leading question if it's not a question, but it does presume that uh, that you have a hero, right? I'll let you all know, I have one hero. I, I would like to say I don't have a hero, but I do have a hero who I seek to emulate. Uh, however, he is not real. He's not an actual person. Um, more than anyone... I want to emulate Uncle Iroh, yeah. <laughs> Uncle Iroh from from uh, Avatar The Last Airbender. He is everything that I want to be. I swear to God, I don't enjoy Jasmine Tea just because he enjoys it. 
I think that I was called an old soul ever since I was young. And aging hasn't intimidated me very much. It feels more like growing into myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, we're yapping for now. We'll get to the story. <laughs> Uwo, we're going to be reading Liar by Isaac Asimov. And I found quite the treat. When I was looking for a PDF, I discovered that someone had an old copy of ah, <laughs> had an old copy of Astounding Science Fiction, the sci-fi mag or the sci-fi periodical. And oh, the cover is amazing. <laughs> So we're going to be reading from an ancient old book from 1941. I, I'm looking forward to this. It's very fun. It's complete with all of the inline advertisements, which is very cute. Yeah, old sci-fi. Asimov loved his logic puzzles. 1941 was 20 years ago. Ah, yes. <laughs> Contra Perry, you joke. But I am quite happy with my library. My biggest fear is that my library is lost on the way to Europe when I move. That is, like, my biggest fear right now. Okay, no, biggest fear is uh, the Boeing jet that I'm in falling apart while I'm over the Atlantic or Arctic Oceans. <laughs> you know, I was talking the other day on stream about how libraries used to be incredible rare things, and... There would only be maybe, if you were lucky, five copies of a book. There were only a few books that were copied many times. But... I, I just was thinking about how libraries were things for academics, for scholars, for a very specific class of people. But now, owning books is a common thing. Books are cheap to print. And a personal library... So I'm talking about personal libraries. Um, I was looking at my bookshelf and thinking, only a couple thousand years ago, this would have been decadent. And it is. Jordan, I do fly Lufthansa. <laughs> I do tend to. It's... I guess I just was appreciating how fortunate I am. Because were I to be in my station those thousands of years ago, I would not have a personal library. But instead, I have something very special. Grizzly, I will never forget buying, uh, what, the Lopsang Rampa story for 25 cents and then learning about how he claimed to be a, Tib a Tibetan monk who was inhabiting the body of a British man. Other than Asimov's science fiction, what are some of my favorite books? Ooh, let me look, because I have it right here. Well, obviously, um, A Scanner Darkly is one of my favorites, but in terms of, like, I feel like 
the, the there's a difference between what I like reading and which books I treasure the most. I quite I quite treasure my copies of the Belgariad and the Malorian. I grew up with those fantasy novels, and they were uh, they were very special to me. I grew up reading them in bed with a little lamp over my shoulder, curled up under the covers in the summer. I, I, I treasure those books quite highly. I had borrowed them from a friend, but eventually I bought my own copies. I'll probably reread them at some point. What else? What do I really treasure? Uh, my copy of Dune. My, my Dune series that were given to me by my mother. She handed me the first novel in sixth grade, and she let me keep the books. And I am, I am quite fond of them. Now I'm very happy that she did. <laughs> uh, what else? Oops. Don't mind me dropping things. Mm. What are the important books? Hmm. Like, I I'm thinking about which books aren't replaceable. That's... Like, which ones do I actually want? Like, which physical copies are important to me? Hmm. There's a collection of short stories that I bought at a Cthulhu convention, a uh, cosmic horror convention a long time ago. Of which, uh, it, the memory of it's very important. Oh, Scottish. My... My parents are happy for me. They're sad that I'm going, right? Um, I never, I never was that far away from them, but they accept that I'm following my happiness. What? What else? It's like really important that I'd feel bad if I lost. Oh, I have a collection of Peanuts comics. Or excuse me, Lil Fellas. There are a few collections of Philip K. Dick that I read at my um, my favorite campground, which is now burned to the ground. Um, can't go back there anymore. It's dead. Um, just as most campgrounds in the Pacific Northwest will be soon. But I have some very fond memories of reading the collection, we can remember it for you wholesale. How do you burn down a campground? Global warming and rampant wildfires. Wildfire that burnt uh, much of the forest. Can't go back. I grew up there and it's dead now. So, those books that I read at that campground are quite precious to me. Maybe that was a little personal to say. I'm not very good at, at being personal. Hey, Roy. Be good to see you. Alaman, I've done that before. How am I? I'm... I'm in a solemn mood today. 
I can't quite I can't quite explain what I mean by that, but I feel solemn. I feel like I was watching Mike's stream last night of what Garn 47 was it? And I recognized that I was able to just riff on him, but I, uh, <laughs> I need that space to riff. I do well when I have someone else with me. Roy, you know, I, I could use a hug and a piece of cake right now. Though I'm not very good at accepting kindness. So I might resist. <laughs> the J Mike arrive. How do you get over that, chat? How do you, how do you get over the difficulty with accepting kindness? <laughs> Kodiak, it's not about good or bad things happening. It's I am I am quite blessed as I am. Mokamenche. We need the new chatter emote. Maybe I need to go and Grab that from Mike. <laughs> Crying a little in gratitude. I... I don't remember how to cry. It has only happened a few times in recent memory, and it. I went over a decade without doing it. I only remember... I only, like have started to recall how in the last mm, year. I, I don't know. I'm being too personal. I, th this isn't, this is, this it maybe is a bit much. I don't know. I try to maintain a certain level of stoicism. I think that, at least for me, that sort of vulnerability is unbecoming. I had to unlearn it when I made down the rabbit hole. Because I, as the creator, did not exist. Not in any real capacity. I, I wasn't meant to exist. And existing as a creator was undesirable. For the viewer. People got very mad when um, they discovered that I had feelings. The number of people who said that I was now biased because, like, and my work was bad because I had opinions uh, was remarkable. No, Pope Crispy, that's the thing, is uh, it's there was no persona, there was no person. I was effectively disallowed from existing as a human for most of my adult, adult life, now that I think about it. Has it? No, not quite most. It was pretty easy to fall into it because I've never had a very strong sense of self. I don't have an identity. Terribly much of one anyway. I have very little ego. If you tried to tell me that 
If you asked me what I am, I would not be able to tell you. I could tell you what I do. I could tell you some things in which I'm interested. But I could not tell you who I am. I am nebulous. I baked that into my VTuber lore. I am a spirit. I, I feel formless. And the act of becoming a VTuber was creating a body for an, an ephemeral thing. How does... How does something so ephemeral take a form? I am nothing. That... I am nothing? Onto which people ascribe something. And I don't know what to do with that. It's, it's left me at a little bit of a loss, because I'm so used to supplanting that with showing something instead. I say, look at this. Look at this interesting thing that I found. Look at this thing I'm interested in. Something that fascinates me. And... I don't know what to do when there's interest in me. My instinct is to push that interest to the side and say, no, 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 no. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this other thing. Because I have nothing to show you for myself. I... There's nothing here. There's only emptiness. So instead, let me show you the latest AI slop. Because she needs a husband. Is it going to show the right window? Yes, it will. She needs a husband. She is a farmer girl. Am from USA. And then I believe that is the Malaysian flag. <laughs> yes, it is. Mm -mm. I like what they decided to do with the neck. It's just there. Oh my god, and look, there's there's a third leg on whatever this is. The tractor cabin is facing the wrong way. You bet it is. Again, I, I remind all of you that AI is... uh. It's just copy-pasting things. Her head is the tractor. It is. Ooh. Good thought. I wonder if her head was put there because it put the tractor there first. And then it tried to fill in the tractor, but it gave a it, it put a head there. It's very funny how the lighting is very obviously, like, just pulled from another photograph. Her name is Farmer Girl. You're right. Her name is Farmer Girl. Oh, this is some click venture stuff. Hello. I am a Farmer Girl. My name is Farmer Girl. Right? That's nice, said that's lovely. Her name literally is Farmer Girl. I am Farmer Girl.
the camel toe on the t-shirt shadow. <laughs> oh, it's a lot. Is it her birthday? It's her birthday, and also she is a wounded veteran. Oh, uh, there's another one down here. Is this okay? Oh, yeah. Jesus in your bed. Except she's also a part of Jesus. Also, Jesus is stripping. Deva Gaming. You will never regret liking this photo. White Jesus. Oh, is that... Oh my god, wait a minute. There's another arm here. Look, here's... Here's the arm, right? But then there's another tricep. He has double tricep. So I guess like tricep three times two so that's a what a sex sep a sex sep oh yeah and he's like reaching in there like like he's gonna jork it he's gonna jork his peanuts Just double checking that he still has a penis. What's down there? Oh yeah. It's like it's like if Jesus didn't have object permanence, right? He's looking forward, he looks down and says, wait a minute, what's in there? Pulls open his pants. Oh, that's interesting. Huh. I don't remember having that. Then puts his pants away, looks back up. Huh, I wonder what's in my pants, right? It's kind of like the person whose fetish is like they can own the only thing that turns them on is their own flaccid penis. Right? Looks down. Hey, hey, oh, hey, oh, hey, oh, <laughs> an infinite cycle. The tragedy. <laughs> Have I ever turned? told you about the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Boner. <laughs> oh, I also want to show you something. I'm going to take you on a journey. Uh, so... Remember when I said that my managers are Fujoshis? Last time, Kaz was the one who was being put on blast, but this time, uh, Aoife could not help herself. See, the thing is, I was kind of thinking about doing something like this, but uh, Aoife took care of it for us. I like how uh, she chose a sleepy me. And, uh, also this. <laughs> Grab that Nick titty. See, I just get it normally. Like grabbing the chin. Twink and hunk. Nick's, yeah, Nick is on his Bara arc. But this is what I get. Th this is what I get for having a Fujoshi manager. Just can't help herself. Oh, uh, no, with a Q. I remember that one. Make no mistake. So before we read today, there was something else I wanted to, uh, I wanted to show all of you the cover for the collection, well, the publication that originally originally published Liar by Isaac Asimov. Uh, this is real good. You guys, we found a boyfriend for Farmer Girl.
We found. Whoops. We found a husband. Look. She just needs someone that completes her. Imagine being the head on the left here, on, on his right side, just kind of having to watch as these two make out, like this one and her. Who's husband? Husband. I hear Meowpenheimer's voice every time. One of the heads is a tiny mech operator. Good. Also, we will look at art. Don't worry. I know you all. I know you all want to make sure that I remember. I remember. Okay, so, hey everyone. I know that this is a comfy stream. However, I would like to show all of you perhaps the most cringy thing I have seen in an age. You've heard of Skibidi Toilet, but have you heard of Skibidi Biden? Skibidi Biden. Skibidi Biden. Skibidi Skibidi Biden. Skibidi Biden. Jo Jo Jo. Skibidi Skibidi Biden. Oh yeah. Oh boy. This clip is capable of making a Twink's asshole clench so hard that they lose six months of stretching progress. I felt such a deep cringe in my gut that I feel like every bit of food I had eaten just pushed itself through my digestive system, like fight and flight activated, fight or flight activated, and I just needed to get out. But there is no way to escape something that is in my own head. Yeah, that is perhaps... Like, I have seen some pretty bad stuff in recent memory. Some pretty cringy things. But I think that this might... Forgive my language. It might trump them all. I had to use the um, anti-gag technique that Whiskey Dingo taught me. Minus two. Fuck you. That was good. Skibidi Biden. Why was it created? The fact that anything related to Skibidi Toilet reached Stephen Colbert hurt me. I don't understand how does something like this happen how does something like that pass how does it pass the editors how does this happen oh i also wanted to show all of you um something Hacker showed me something as well. It is wholly remarkable that I have friends who will 
see things like this and say, yeah, that's a Fred, like, this reminds me of Fred. I still, to this day, do not know what it, what Fred core is. You know what? Before I show this to you, could I ask chat a question? Could, could, could someone in chat please define Fred core to me? Because I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out for a while now. It's a vibe that would take me a while to untangle in the words. Stuff that look well, yes, Raven. I understand that it defines it. It defines something that I would at least find interest in. Something that someone drove into or something that is just so cursed you need to share it. Weird stuff that has lore or potential lore. Something a twink would like. Something that is utterly confusing and befuddles a random individual. See, that's not even the case. That, that's not even always true. Because look at what Hackerling sent me. I think I felt a little gay. I believe it has happened. I went to an Asian spa. At these, you must disrobe and be naked while in certain parts of the spa. While there and in the hot tub, a man walked in. A twink, if you will. I was sitting, and his penis was quite close to my face as he walked into the hot tub. For the first time, and a brief moment, I looked at a man's body as a potential source of pleasure. It would have been easy to reach out and touch him. His skin seemed soft. A large penis, too. What does this mean for me? Should I try to contact him? Hacker sent this to me and said, This feels like a post you would read. To which I replied, it is now. This feels like the beginning of good timeline Ben Shapiro. Anyone else? Like, this is the beginning of Ben Shapiro being okay, right? Like, because I think even the people who like Ben Shapiro would say that Ben Shapiro is not okay. I don't feel like that is a controversial opinion. However, when I looked at this, I did not see the rest of these. You want to explore this man's gay awakening together? Because apparently this isn't done. I didn't see the rest of these. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. <laughs> I feel like that's how a lot of things on my stream go. You want to look at this? I guess so. Oh, this is long. You know what? Uh, they're here. They're in the post. Give me just a minute. I am going to make another cup of tea because this is going to be a lot of reading. Do we have time? Yeah, we do. Maybe I'll make time. I'll be back in just a couple of minutes, everyone. Just making some tea. I would recommend you also stand up, stretch your legs, stretch your arms, get yonder selves sippies. And I'll see you in just a couple minutes.
Yo, wait, this is misogyny posting? Oh, we gotta get in on this then. Oh, I'm like so ready to jump into this, this post history. Oh my god. So, hypothetically, for the sake of argument, what if I found a fellow man to be attractive? Sexy, if you will. Would that make me gay? I have a wife, after all, who I assure you is very satisfied, so how could I possibly be gay? <laughs> that was fast. Yeah, I, uh, I already had the water heated. I keep the water warm when I'm streaming. Don't forget she's not satisfied. Yep, yeah, she told him that pussies are not supposed to be wet. Mm. Gotcha, Marco. Maybe I read the last post. Not showing it on stream. So uh, let's dip into this man's gay awakening, shall we? I think I felt a little gay, and then... What is it like to go to a gay bathhouse? I'm considering my options. There is a very famous one in my city. What is it like for a man who has never had sex with another man? If I get scared, will it be possible for me to simply enjoy the baths and maybe only witness the gay sex? I have been tempted by gay thoughts lately, and I am looking for a space to explore them. I'm sure that this is, yeah, no, this is something that he has been considering for a very long time. I'll put it this way. These are not new thoughts. I keep walking by the bathhouse and not entering. How do I gain gay courage? Hey Chad, this is a great question just in general. How do I gain gay courage? Do I make that one of my tags? Gay courage. I have walked by it twice today. I have watched from afar to see what men are entering. I get close and cannot bring myself to enter. This man is just supplanting entering this gay bathhouse, quote-unquote? Is there such a thing as a gay bathhouse? That is a good raid message. Yeah, raid message today is going to be, how do I gain gay courage? The answer is you've, is that you have a nice, strong cat man there for you. Did I say that out loud? Oh, fuck. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Hellenistic gay is gay for people who like marble statues. And use them at their, as their profile pictures. So, I get close and cannot bring myself to enter. How do I change this and begin the process? I want to get this over with to know for certain if I am gay. Hey bro. I uh... I have some good news for you. You don't have to enter to know if you're gay. I can already tell you. Oh yeah, here we go. Some revelations that have come to me since I have been gay. Hello. As many of you know, I am gay now. I like the implication that he is gay now as if it was something he needed to declare like bankruptcy. I declare gay. It has been a full week now since I saw the twink penis at the Asian spa. Much has happened within for me. The world is an entirely new place. 
my relationship to it will never be the same. I would like to list a few things I have noticed since. When I walk around the city's streets, I feel much more free to walk with a smile and possibly swing my hips more so than I classically did while straight. My body feels more free and in tune with the flow of life energy. Guys, I don't think this person is just gay. I think that they are trans gay. Like, their identity isn't as a man or a woman or as non-binary. Their ident- their gender identity is gay. <laughs> Women are the true holders. Oh my god. Oh yeah, this is getting good. Women are the true holders of conservative culture, and in many ways their biology writes the script of the mile markers of age. Buying a house, having a child, marriage, these activities all revolve around the demands of the womb. Without this, a man is free to live many lives and enjoy the journey of it. This dude is speed running like gay misogyny. In a similar vein, a gay man experiences the effects of aging differently. This movement of age leads to the many subcultures one may find themselves in as a gay man. The twink may one day find themselves a daddy. A bear may discover the joys of healthy eating and become a slim otter. With every transformation, the gay man acquires different partners and sexual experiences. The gay man does not mourn this passing. He embraces it. I'm trying to figure out... How... Guys, we need to sit down and have a cultural conversation. Is this based? <laughs> when you are gay, you join a tribe that extends throughout time and space. I, for one, consider myself within the flow of Alexander, and every gay thought I have is dedicated to his legacy. <laughs> Oh my god, fucking in the name of Alexander. Welcome in, Chiplin. I... Oh. Oh, I love this. This do. Oh my god. He's a sub to Alexander the Great and, like, never met the guy. Like, he discovered he was gay and decided he was going to be a part of Alexander's gay harem. How did Hacker find this? It has over 100,000 likes, so I imagine it showed up in her For You tab. I don't ever look at the For You tab, so... Gay men are unbridled sexuality, and one must be careful. I have not had any gay sex yet, however, men have propositioned me multiple times this week. There is a directness that must be managed if you are a man who plays coy such as me. I am looking forward to even more revelations in the coming days. Even more so, I am ready for the incredible experience and information download to come when I finally have gay sex. That word, information download, gives me a bit of trepidation. This could, potentially, be a reference to a specific kind of, I don't know whether or not to call it conspiracy theory, 
Some people believe that they receive information from aliens and the term information download is sometimes used in this way. There is a non-zero chance that we continue this story and he starts talking about how gay sex allowed him to receive information from aliens. I should note, by the way, that some major players in the uh, UFO sphere claim to receive information downloads. The Galians. Look up Alexander in Fate. Iskander, the one that goes by Alexander, is the young version. Oh. Iskander. Okay. Uh, images, I guess? Uh, I'm just getting a bunch of missile launchers. Is it maybe anime? Am I finding the wrong one? He kind he has like big mutton chops that go all the way up to his hair. Or not mutton chops, uh, just a beard that goes all the way up. Try using writer. Extremely bara. Okay. This guy. This guy. Bless. The missile launchers are also gay. See, now I imagine this guy being like, I am gay now and I am ready to see, I'm ready to receive Iskander's seed. And like he has a missile fired directly at him as he's face down ass up. A prostate-seeking missile. Okay. He do be Dorfin. Yeah, he, he is Ganondorf-coded. A little bit. It's the beard. It's 100% the beard. Okay. Oh, yeah. He, oh, now it's getting... Ooh, it's getting complicated now. We're adding some complication. Can one be gay and not become aroused at the sight of gay porn? Gather, friends. Let us solve this issue together. My com conversion to the gay lifestyle has been nothing short of miraculous. Also, we're getting a timeline here, right? This was 23 days ago, and now we have 15 days ago. It took him five days to start, like, having philosophical thoughts about being gay. My conversion to the gay lifestyle has been nothing short of miraculous. It has been a little over two weeks since I have accepted my love of men. It is as if a great dam within my mind has been unblocked. The deep waters rushing upon the land. Hey, don't bet me. Despite these changes, one may say I am still in the planning phases of my first gay act. I have downloaded Grinder and had pleasant chat with men on there. I have even given out my first positive compliment to a man's erect dick. I have a date planned with a trans woman this week. Such is the life of an active and careful planner. However, one must note, when I watch gay porn, I often gain no erection. This concerns me, for I long to be amongst these men and feel their embrace. I want to let loose in gay abandon, but my loins do not follow suit. It should be noted I do still find the experience entertaining. I love to see the men enjoying themselves and the masculine force that generates between them. When I speak to a gay man in person, I begin to feel the stirrings of desire and lust, 
and my inner queen begins to <laughs> express through my voice and posturing. My desire for women's bodies is like a drunken magnetic pull. Maybe my desire for men is much more a dance of courtship. I desired to be wooed by the right man and let my lust flow from there. It is two different sides of my sexuality, it seems. Yeah, this dude is discovering bi people. Pray tell. Watch it. Why does he talk like, oh my god, he's taking the whole I am gay for Alexander thing way too far. This is, this is all coming from his... I, uh, I have gay sex for Alexander, isn't it? Pray tell. What should I do about this precarious situation? Are such things common for the masculine bisexual? Is this a simple case of my body having no reference point to the pleasure of a man as of yet? Are there resources I can access to encourage my gay lust? Dude, this man is gay maxing. He's gay maxing. He's like, how can I increase my gay? I, yeah, for the glory of Rome. Oh my god, he's a Romosexual. Okay, uh, I was informed that there may be a naughty word in one of these. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just double checking here. Uh, looking, looking, looking. Nope, that's Skibidi Biden. Whoops. Uh. Oh my god, this is incredible, though. I'm not seeing it. Hmm. Hold on, I'm looking. I'm double checking. I'm not seeing it. It was a mistake and it was in a comment. Oh, okay. All right, we dive in with reckless abandon. My first LGBT experience and the things I have learned. There are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks where decades happen. Vladimir Lenin. He opens with a quote from Lenin. Oh, we are in for a treat. Welcome, my friends. I'm coming up on three weeks of being gay. Dude, I hate to say it, but you were probably gay the whole time. Each passing day has shown me new shades and layers of a gay universe which continues to astonish me, yet I know I belong. To find my home here, I am only asked to shed layer upon layer of the false self I constructed. But now, the planning the contemplation, the deep meditation, has paid off. I come before you a changed man. I have crossed the waters to the far shore. I stand firmly upon the soil of my first LGBT experience. Look, dude, I'm just saying, if, if you soiled during your experience, you probably should have just cleaned yourself out a little bit. <clears throat> anyway... On Grinder, I have been presented a dizzying buffet of hole and shaft. 
However, one trans woman stood out to me. She was model gorgeous and a good conversationalist. I am coy as a gay man, so a friendly conversation was a refreshing respite. I will not kiss and tell, but kiss we did. So you literally just did it. However, I will say no one revealed a penis that night. It was like a night with a high school lover. It was sensuality I had not felt in many years. This dude... This, this dude is... He's Demi, right? Like, he's, he's just Demi. Writing such a thing has proven a challenge. After all, how would I begin to share the details of such a thing without diving into simple smut? When faced with this dilemma, I turned to the wisdom of the wise Swiss man, Carl Jung. Fate would have it, and this has always been the case with me, that all the outer aspects of my life should be accidental. Only what is interior has proved to have substance and a determining value. Perhaps these outer events were never so very essential anyhow, or were so only in that they coincided with my phases with phases of my inner development. Oh yeah. The Swiss are strange and untrustworthy. <laughs> he went in straight and came out both gay and racist. <laughs> However, they have produced some characters of note. I digress. Following this wisdom, let me turn the locus of attention upon what I have learned, rather than the mechanisms of LGBT contact. Men, take note. There is pleasure within our ranks. This dude is writing as though he's preparing a speech that he is going to deliver from a podium. Their men take note, there is pleasure within our ranks. If you find someone you physically and emotionally, emotionally click with, the experience is not much different. Nay, it may be even better. Those with similar biology understand your sexual needs more, and there is less of a cultural script to your interactions. True sexual cre creativity can shine through. This, this dude, when this dude discovers furries, his brain is going to explode. Oh my god. He's not ready. If he encounters furries, he is going to have a transcendental experience. Need this guy to be a Disco Elysium character. Oh my god. Oh my god, now I want a Disco Elysium Fugi. I want I want my my VTuber drawn up in the Disco Elysium style now. That actually might be sick. If you truly hold the gay within you, you must express it. This dude in another life is a cult leader. Even the tiniest bit must be allowed to shine. Follow the one drop rule in this regard. I thought for many years such desires were not important until that fateful Asian penis <laughs> changed everything. <laughs> that fateful Asian penis. 
Oh, now I'm kinder, happier, and that aching to express myself in a way I do not understand is no more. This life is precious. Do not waste it as half of who you are. Once you diversify your attraction, women will see... Th oh, we're getting into the misogyny now. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Oh, this is kind of like... Okay, okay. I feel like I have been eating a particularly delicious donut and I just suddenly bit through to the jelly filling and like it, it kind of it kind of almost ruins the experience a little. Anyone else ever have like a donut that's so good that's that it's ruined by the filling? Jelly filling. I guess I should say the, the creamy misogynist center. Yeah, okay, a few people. I, I feel like I'm 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 crazy. But I've like I've had I've had donuts where the dough is just so good that I that like I don't want there to be filling. I just want more dough. <laughs> Once you diversify your attraction, women will seethe. They no longer hold a monopoly on your sexual life. Never was I at a lower point when I thought this and had sex with four different women in a week. I know now I will never have to listen to another woman quote Natasha Benningfield lyrics or talk about office politics simply to have sex. I can now focus my attention on truly astounding women, should I choose that route. In my times of horniness, when offered the choice between sleeping with a fat woman and going the rainbow road. Hold on. In my times of horniness, when offered the choice between sleeping with a fat woman and going the rainbow road, I know which way I shall pick. Women should celebrate their loss of a monopoly. A bisexual man will not deceive you simply for the sake of his loins when he could participate in several prep-fueled orgies at his local Hilton. Let us be together in masculine revelry and join you for the right reasons. Incels, I beg you, just be gay. If you try it once and hate it, no harm has been done. If you love it, welcome to a life of, on untold pleasures and the constant companionship that you seek. Every day, I come closer to God. This experience has only deepened my desire for the bathhouse. May you all be who you are and live without regret. Thank you. Oh, he is... coming closer to God with every sexual encounter. I hope that that man has a long and fruitful gay life. I kind of love this. <laughs> there are so many good quotes in there. You know what, everyone? I'm adding the ASMR tag again. I'm doing it. I feel like, uh, I feel like with some of these 
changes. I've earned it. Some of uh, the microphone changes. I That was a propos of nothing. I was just thinking about that while I was reading. I was enjoying my gay life. I hope he gets over the Swiss phobia. The misogyny I can take or leave. But the Swiss phobia, I think he really needs to, to draw. <laughs> yeah, the Swiss comment was completely out of left field. No, I agree. Just absolutely out of nowhere. Ke Ke Kevin, it's a running gag, don't worry. <laughs> Just try it. Just try it. <laughs> Jack7, I think that the Swiss are just happy to be acknowledged. Okay, but actually for real, you guys, what if someone thought that I was being serious with the, the mis with Astraline's misogyny streamer thing? And I actually had a call out post written about me. <laughs> I think I might retweet it. <laughs> time to erect the cathedral of misogyny yeah i i i reveal that i'm joking i reveal that the misogyny is a joke and um suddenly my viewership dips by half Hey guys, you know what I want to do? Oh yeah, radioactive. If someone wanted to bad I'm faith. I'm making a call out. Frederick Knudsen is a bitch ass motherfucker. He's misogynist, and I'm gonna make a post on my Twitter.com. Do it. It's time for sparring in the field of social media. Okay, don't. Yeah, Karlovich, something I was kind of realizing is people on social media think that everything is the most important thing ever and cannot conceive that there are things happening in real life. Free drag name. No, free drag name. Here we go. Miss Sandry, I think, is a l works a little bit better. I have... Oh, wait. Is there a Mechanicus 2 trailer now? Okay, hold on. Oh, okay, I, I need to see this now. I didn't realize that there was a trailer. The trailer for the first Mechanicus game was incredible. We are taking a quick sideline, everyone. Even... Whoops. I goofed. One second. Okay. Well, I pressed the wrong button. Great. Okay, hold on. I'm dumb. I'm 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 dumb. Ugh, press the wrong button. Okay, I need to fix this. Okay, we're fine. How annoying is this going to be? That's the question. Oh, this is going to be really annoying. Okay, whatever. 
It's amazing how just pressing the wrong button immediately creates huge problems. And I have to like, it, it, it takes another like 15 minutes to fix everything. Has anyone else ever had that experience? Because I just did. Okay, I want to see this. Okay, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Necron, fellas. From the moment I first witnessed the interlopers, oh. they disgusted me. Eons we slumbered, waiting to reclaim our galaxy. Only for it to become infested with vermin that proliferated in our absence. Now, we awaken to retake what is ours. Wretched are now the nations of meat and metal, shackled to ignorance by your faith. Do you truly believe you can stop us? We, who have shattered our very gods and enslaved them to our will. The stars were young when our empire was ascendant. And when the last of them die, we alone will remain. For we Okay. 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 Okay, I'm very curious. We don't actually play as the Necrons, right? Like, it's called Mechanicus, too. No clue what the dude was saying. Oh, <laughs> that seems to be something that is very common with Warhammer 40k, where they apply such heavy, heavy filters to characters' voices that it's impossible to understand. The music was, yeah, okay. The music in the original Mechanicus game was unreal. And then the music in their next game, Ixion, was also unreal. Guillaume David, as far as I can tell, has never made... Like, he hasn't been on any projects before Mechanicus. He was just like, oh yeah, by the way, I'm awesome. Two campaigns. Ooh, okay, I'm really interested now. Okay. The Necron Lord you play as in the game is a woman, so only one campaign for you. <laughs> oh, oh no. Okay, F fair enough. There is an inherent problem here. <laughs> I see. Okay, the small barrier. Hey, you know what we haven't done yet? We haven't looked at art. I'm going to play this game as though I were a woman. Oh, dear. Okay, we're checking for art. Art, 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 art. Okay. 
Oh, we have we have progress on the cross stitch, I believe. Yep, yep. We do. Progress is being made. Have you heard of the critically acclaimed MMORPG Fantasy Final Fantasy XIV with an expanded free trial, which you can play through the entirety of A Realm Reborn and the award-winning Heaven Sword expansion, up to level sixty for free? And uh, we're we're getting there. And oh, oh my God. Oh my goodness. Okay, there's some good stuff here. <laughs> oh, there's me, me muting myself at the beginning of stream. Yeah, it's like, oh, this is just a Mary stream now. You just want to hear Mary. Aw, Owlet and Ink Dog yapping. We had we crossed the streams yesterday and had Owlet and Ink Dog. Mary was really tired. I was worried about him. Oh, there's Mary making his sounds. Th this is exactly how it feels listening to him. What are you going to when, when he's making weird noises? Also, greetings, Fred the Mum. Is that me as as a Harthian? By God's glory, sinner. <laughs> I'm so happy that we got him replying to that person immediately. Honk, work, synergies, play with me. Are you are you fucking drawing me giggling? By Alexander's glory. Did you draw me giggling? I'm going to scream. <laughs> Fred is our Jesus. Ah, a tactical cutoff there. Ah, oh, yes, seed maker. In insults for for men. Nothing but a seed maker. Oh, and there's Jack calling him stinky. Good. Mary, you drew Mary so expressive, and I love it. I, you keep drawing me so delighted, and it's precious. <laughs> ah, I, see, I look at these. Sometimes I look at these, and I say, I can't actually be this cute, can I? Do I des do I deserve? Have I earned being drawn like this? I don't feel like I've earned it. I'm weird and uncomfortable. Yeah, I suppose I'm not the arbiter of it. People who draw me are, huh? I just kind of have to accept it one way or the other. Yeah, it's I, I don't choose how other people see me. So, hey chat, I, hmm, I have some tea left. I think I'm going to finish up this cup of tea, get up and make another cup, and then we'll read our story for the day. How about that? I'm excited to share this one with all of you, I like it. It's, uh, it's a particular favorite of mine. Yep, you don't get to choose your legacy, and by that same token, you don't get to choose how other people see you. You can try to influence it, but at the end of the day, people are going to come in with their own preconceptions. And there's only so much we can do to influence that. Oh, by the way... Tomorrow, CoffeeZilla is going to be releasing part two of his uh, Rabbit R1 investigation. And that's going to be interesting. Uh, we will definitely watch it together. Tomorrow, we won't have time to watch Jenny Nicholson's video. 
Uh, we're going to have to do it next Friday, I think. But we'll do it next week. Also, I've, by the way, I've prodded Xander about potentially coming to story time next week. I'm going to see if I can find a story that he hasn't read that's a little bit on the weirder side. I've asked him if he has read, um, if he's read I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. If he hasn't, we'll read that. If he has, we'll find something else. Something else weird and uncomfy. Legacy maxing. Yeah, how do people remember Napoleon? Do they remember him for being a great conqueror, for shaping our world? No, they remember him for being short. And he wasn't even short. So don't worry too much about trying to choose your legacy. Short and having one hand. <laughs> yeah, we can't escape. Oh, by the way, um, I'll have this on the schedule next week, but I am going to be joining Susu, the person who rigged my model. I'm going to be joining her on her stream, and we're going to be looking into an ARG. She has a few candidates that she wants to look at on stream. But um, what, what's going to happen is probably on Wednesday, I'm going to stream and then I'm going to raid into her stream and it's going to be a long day for me. That's, that's the plan. So we got, we got plans. I have so many plans. Okay, I'm going to down this cup of tea really quick, and I'm going to go get another cup of tea. This is going to take a vanishingly short amount of time. I go to BRB anyways, and when we come back, we're going to read Liar by Isaac Asimov, an interesting little logic puzzle of a short story. I'd like to see if you all can solve the puzzle as I'm reading it. I would encourage you while I'm reading the story to chat amongst each other and see if you can figure out what the problem is and what's actually happening. How long is the read? It's not super long. It's... I don't know. We'll take like 30 minutes for it or something. Max? Not even. Probably more like 20 minutes. It's really not long. Okay, be right back. Just gonna get some tea so I can hydrate during the story.
Hello, Owlets. I told you I wouldn't be gone long. Don't worry. I hope you didn't miss me too much while I was away. <laughs> hey, Shushu. Thanks for gifting a sub to Piozoro. All right. Are you ready? I am very fond of this story. And I hope that you all enjoy it as much as I do. And we also get to see the inline advertisements. <laughs> A fun little bit of history. Let me recalibrate real quick. There. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Shall we? So first, let's check out the uh, the cover of Astounding Science Fiction. He looks... This looks like he's going to smack his pecs. Like, come back here so I can smack you. Mm. Gonna start patting his muscles. But shall we? What else was published in here? A uh, story from Heinlein was put in here. It's interesting that Isaac Asimov was, uh, he was what? After universe, right? Like, it's interesting. They have novelettes, not quite novellas, a little bit longer. It does look like softcore erotica, doesn't it? I I see that as well. That was that was my first impression. I'm like, why is this in here? We read universe. Oh, cool. All right, shall we? I love. Look at this. This is our robot. I think this is meant to be Susan Calvin. Who is, in this story, she definitely, like, this is the story where Susan Calvin undergoes her transformation from, you know, pretty normal woman of the era, uh, if not extremely intelligent and talented, to the badass that she becomes. Look at all. Liar by Isaac Asimov. Alfred Lanning lit his cigar carefully, but the tips of his fingers were trembling slightly. His gray eyebrows hunched low as he spoke between puffs. It reads mine's all right. Damn little doubt about that. But why? He looked at mathematician Peter Bogart. Well, Bogart flattened his black hair down with both hands. That was the 34th RB model we've turned out, Lanning. All the others were strictly orthodox. The third man at the table frowned. Milton Ash was the youngest off officer of the U.S. Robot and Mechanical Men Incorporated and proud of his post. Listen, Bogart, there wasn't a hitch in the assembly from start to finish. I guarantee that. Bogart's thick lips spread in a patronizing smile. Do you? If you can answer for the entire assembly line, I recommend your promotion. By exact count, there are 75,234 operations necessary for the manufacture of a single positronic brain, each separate operation depending for successful completion upon any number of factors from 5 to 105. If any one of them goes seriously wrong, the brain is ruined. I quote our own information folder, Ash. Milton Ash flushed, but a fourth voice cut off his reply. If we're going to start by trying to fix the blame on one another, I'm leaving. 
Susan Calvin's hands were folded tightly in her lap, and the little lines about her thin, pale lips deepened. We've got a mind-reading robot on our hands, and it strikes me as rather important that we find out just why it reads minds. We're not going to do that by saying, your fault, my fault. Her cold gray eyes fastened upon Ash, and he grinned. Lanning grinned too, and, as always at such times, his long white hair and shrewd little eyes made him the picture of a biblical patriarch. True for you, Dr. Calvin. His voice became suddenly crisp. Here's everything in pill concentrate form. We've produced a positronic brain of supposedly ordinary vintage that's got the remarkable property of being able to tune in on thought waves. It would mark the most important advance in robotics in decades if we knew how it happened. We don't, and we have to find uh, we have to find out. Is that clear? May I make a suggestion? asked Bogert. Go ahead. I'd say that until we do figure out the mess, and as a mathematician I expect it to be a very devil of a mess, we keep the existence of RB34 a secret. I mean even from the other members of the staff. As heads of the department, we ought not to find it an insoluble problem, and the fewer know about it. Bogart is right, said Dr. Calvin. Ever since the interplanetary code was modified to allow robot models to be tested in the plants before being shipped out into space, anti-robot propaganda has increased. If any word leaks out about a robot being able to read minds before we can announce complete control of, of the phenomenon, Tyrone and his demagogues could make pretty effective capital out of it. Lanning sucked at his cigar and nodded gravely. He turned to Ash. I think you said you were alone when you first stumbled on this thought-reading business? I said I was alone. I got the scare of my life. I'll say I was alone. I got I got the scare of my life. RB34 had just been taken off the assembly table and they sent him down to me. Oberman was off somewhere, so I took him down to the testing rooms myself. At least I started to take him down. Ash paused and a tiny smile tugged at his lips. Say, did any of you ever carry on a thought conversation without knowing it? No one bothered to answer and he continued... You don't realize it at first, you know. He just spoke to me, as logically and sensibly as you can imagine, and it was only when I was most of the way down to the testing rooms that I realized that I hadn't said anything. Sure, I had thought lots, but that isn't the same thing, is it? I locked that thing up and ran for landing, having it walk, walking beside me, calmly peering into my thoughts and picking and choosing among them gave me the willies. I imagine it would, said Susan Calvin thoughtfully. Her eyes fixed themselves upon Ash in an oddly intent manner. We are so accustomed to considering our own thoughts private. Lanning broke in impatiently. Then only the four of us know. All right, we've got to go about this systematically. Ash, I want you to check over the assembly line from beginning to end. Everything. You're to eliminate all operations in which there was no possible chance of an error and list all those where there were together with its nature and possible magnitude. Tall order, grunted Ash. Naturally. Of course, you're to put the men under you to work on this, every single one if you have to, and I don't care if we go behind schedule either. But they're not to know why, you understand. Mm, yes, the young technician grinned wryly. It's still a Lulu of a job. Lanning swiveled about in his chair and faced Calvin. You'll have to tackle the job from the other direction. You're the robo-psychologist of the plant, so you're to study the robot itself and work backwards. Try to find out how he ticks. See what else is tied up with his telepathic powers, how far they extend, how they warp his outlook, and just exactly what harm it has done to his ordinary RB properties. You've got that? Lanning didn't wait for Dr. Calvin to answer. 
I'll coordinate the work and interpret the findings mathematically. He puffed violently at his cigar and mumbled the rest through that smoke. Bogart will up me there, of course. Bogart polished the nails of one pudgy hand with the other and said blandly, I dare say, I know a little in the line. Well, I'll get started. Ash shoved his chair back and rose. His pleasantly youthful voice crinkled in a grin. I've got the darndest job of any of us, so I'm getting out of here and to work. He left with a slurred, be seeing you. Susan Calvin answered with a barely perceptible nod, but her eyes followed him out of sight, and she did not answer when Lanning grunted and said, You want to go up and see RB34 now, Dr. Calvin? RB-34's photoelectric eyes lifted from the book at the muffled sound of hinges turning, and he was upon his feet when Susan Calvin entered. She paused to readjust the huge no-entrance sign upon the door, and then approached the robot with a friendly smile. "'I brought you the texts upon hyperatomic motors, Herbie. A few anywhere. A few anyway. Would you care to look at them?' RB-34, otherwise known as Herbie, lifted the three heavy books from her arms and opened to the title page of one. Hmm. Theory of hyperatomics, he mumbled inarticulately, inarticulately to himself as he flipped the pages and then spoke with an abstracted air. Sit down, Dr. Galvin. This will take me a few minutes. The psychologist seated herself and watched Herbie narrowly as he took a chair at the other side of the table and went through the three books systematically. At the end of half an hour, he put them down. Of course, I know why you brought these. The corner of Dr. Calvin's lip twitched. I was afraid you would. It's difficult to work with you, Herbie. You're always a step ahead of me. It's the same with these books, you know, as with the others. They just... Don't interest me. There's nothing to your textbooks. Your science is just a mass of collected data plastered together by makeshift theory, and all so incredibly simple that it's scarcely worth bothering about. It's your fiction that interests me. Your studies on the interplay of human motives and emotions. His mighty hand gestured vaguely as he sought the proper words. Dr. Calvin whispered, I think I understand. I see into minds, you see, the robot continued, and you have no idea how complicated they are. I can't begin to understand everything because my own mind has so little in common with them, but I try, and your novels help. Yes, but I'm afraid that after going through some of the harrowing emotional experiences of our present-day sentimental novel, there was a tinge of bitterness in her voice. You find real minds like ours dull and colorless. But I don't. The sudden energy in the response brought the other to her feet. She felt herself reddening and thought wildly, He must know. Herbie subsided suddenly and muttered in a low voice from which the metallic timber departed almost entirely. But of course I know about it, Dr. Calvin. You think of it always, so how can I help but know? Her face was hard. Have you... told anyone? Of course not! This with genuine surprise. No one has asked me. Well then, she flung out. Oh, I just realized I forgot something. He. <laughs> well then, she flung out. I suppose you think I'm a fool. No! It is a normal emotion. Perhaps that's why it's so foolish. The wistfulness in her voice drowned out everything else. Some of the women peered through the layer of doctorhood. I am not what you would call attractive. If you are referring to mere physical attraction, I couldn't judge. But I know in any case that there are other types of attraction. Nor young. Dr. Calvin had scarcely heard the robot. You are not yet forty. An anxious in insistence had crept into Herbie's voice. Thirty-eight as you count the years. A shriveled sixty as far as my emotional outlook on life is concerned. Am I a psychologist for nothing? 
She drove on with bitter breathlessness, and he's barely thirty and looks and acts younger. Do you suppose he ever sees me as anything but... but what I am? You are wrong. Herbie's steel fist struck the plastic top table with a strident clang. Listen to me. But Susan Calvin whirled on him now, and the hunted pain in her eyes became a blaze. Why should I? What do you know about it at all, anyway, you... you machine? I'm just a specimen to you, an interesting bug with a peculiar mind spread-eagled for inspection. It's a wonderful example of frustration, isn't it? Almost as good as your books. Her voice, emerging in dry sobs, choked into silence. The robot cowered at the outburst. He shook his head pleadingly. Won't you listen to me, please? I could help you if you would let me. How? Oh, her lips curled. By giving me good advice? No, not that. It's just that I know what other people think. Milton Ash, for instance. There was a long silence, and Susan Calvin's eyes dropped. I don't want to know what he thinks, she gasped. Keep quiet. I think you would want to know what he thinks. Her head remained bent but her breath came more quickly. You're talking nonsense. She whispered. Why should I? I'm trying to help. Milton Ash's thoughts of you... He paused. And then the psychologist raised her head. Well? The robot said quietly, He loves you. For a full minute, Dr. Calvin did not speak. She merely stared. Then, you're mistaken. You must be. Why should he? But he does. A little thing like that cannot be hidden. Not from me. But I am so... So... She stammered to a halt. He looks deeper than the skin and admires intellect in others. Milton Ash is not the type to marry a head of hair and a pair of eyes. Susan Calvin found herself blinking rapidly and waited before speaking. Even then, her voice trembled. Yet, he certainly never in any way indicated, Have you ever given him a chance? How could I? I never thought that- Exactly! The psychologist paused in thought and then looked up suddenly. A girl visited him here at the plant half a year ago. She was pretty, I suppose blonde and slinky, and of course could scarcely add two and two. He spent all day puffing out his chest trying to explain how a robot was put together. The hardness had returned. Not that she understood. Who was she? Herbie answered without hesitation. I know the person you're referring to. She's his first cousin. There is no romantic interest there, I assure you. Susan Calvin rose to her feet with a vivacity almost girlish. Now, isn't that strange? That's exactly what I used to pretend to myself sometimes, though I never really thought it so. Then it all must be true. She ran to Herbie and seized his cold, heavy hand in both hers. Thank you, Herbie. Her voice was an urgent, husky, husky whisper. Don't tell anyone about this. Let it be our secret. And thank you again. With that, and a convulsive squeeze of Herbie's unresponsive metal fingers, she left. Herbie turned slowly to his neglected novel, but there was no one to read his thoughts. Milton Ash stretched slowly and magnificently to the tune of cracking joints and a chorus of grunts, and then glared at Peter Bogert, Ph.D. Say, he said, I've been at this for a week now with just about no sleep. How long do I have to keep it up? I thought you said the positronic bombardment in Vac Chamber D was the solution. Bogert yawned, and delicate, yawned delicately and regarded his white hands with interest. It is. I'm on the track. I know what that means when a mathematician says it. How near the end are you? Mm, it all depends. On what? 
Ash dropped into a chair and stretched his long legs out before him. On landing, the old fellow disagrees with me. He sighed. A bit behind the times, that's the trouble with him. He clings to matrix mechanics as the all-in-all, -all, and this problem calls for more powerful mathematical tools. He's so stubborn. Ash muttered sleepily, uh, why not ask Herbie and settle the whole affair? Ask the robot. Bogert's eyebrows climbed. Why not? Didn't the old girl tell you? You mean Calvin? Yeah, Susie herself. That robot's a mathematical whiz. He knows all about everything, plus a bit on the side. He does triple integrals in his head and eats up tensor analysis for dessert. The mathematician stared skeptically. Are you serious? So help me. The catch is that the dope doesn't like math. He'd rather read slushy novels. Honest, you should see the, the tripe Susie keeps feeding him. Purple passion and love in space. Dr. Calvin hasn't said a word of it to us. Well, she hasn't finished studying him. Uh, you know how she is. Just likes to have everything just so before letting out the big secret. She told you. Well, we sort of got to talking. I've been seeing a lot of her lately. He opened his eyes wide and frowned. Say, Bogey, have you been noticing anything queer about the dame lately? Bogert relaxed into an undignified grin. She's using lipstick, if that's what you mean. Hell, I know that. Rouge, powder, and eyeshadow, too. She's a sight, but it's not that. I can't put my finger on it. It's the way she talks, as if she were happy about something. He thought a little and then shrugged. The other allowed himself a leer, which, for a scientist past 50, was not a bad job. Maybe she's in love. Ash allowed his eyes to close again. You're nuts, Bogey. You go speak to Herbie. I want to stay here and go to sleep. Right. Not that I particularly like having a robot tell me my job, not that I think he can do it. A soft snore was his only answer. Herbie listened carefully as Peter Bogert, hands in pockets, spoke with elaborate indifference. So, there you are. I've been told you understand these things, and I'm asking you more in curiosity than anything else. My line of reasoning, as I've outlined it, involves a few doubtful steps, I admit, which Dr. Lanning refuses to accept, and the picture is still rather incomplete. The robot didn't answer, and Bogert said, Well? I see no mistake. Herbie studied the scribbled fingers. Figures. I don't suppose you can go any further than that? I daren't try. You're a better mathematician than I, and... Well, I'd hate to commit myself. There was a shade of complacency in Bogert's smile. I rather thought that would be the case. It is deep. Uh, well, forget it. He crumpled the sheets, tossed them down the waste chaff, turned to leave, and then thought better of it. By the way... The robot waited. Bogert seemed to have difficulty. There is something... That is, perhaps you can... He stopped. Herbie spoke quietly. Your thoughts are confused, but there is no doubt at all that they concern Dr. Lanning. It is silly to hesitate, for as soon as you compose yourself, I'll know what it is you want to ask. The mathematician's hand went to his sleek hair in the familiar smoothing gesture. Lanning is past 70, he said, as if that explained everything. I know that. And he's been director of the plant for almost 30 years. Herbie nodded. Well now, Bogert's voice became ingratiating. You would know whether... Whether he's thinking of resigning? Health, perhaps, or some other... Quite, said Herbie. And that was all. Well, do you know? Certainly. Then, uh... Could you tell me? Since you ask, yes. The robot was quite matter-of-fact about it. 
He has already resigned. What? The exclamation was an explosive, almost inarticulate sound. The scientist's large head hunched forward. Say that again. He has already resigned, came the quiet repetition, but it has not yet taken effect. He is waiting, you see, to solve the problem of, uh, myself. That finished, he is quite ready to turn the office of director over to his successor. Bogart expelled his breath sharply, and the successor, who is he? He was quite close to Herbie now, eyes fixed fascinatedly on those unreadable, dull red photoelectric cells that were the robot's eyes. Words came slowly. You are the next director. And Bogart relaxed into a tight smile. That is good to know. I've been hoping and w waiting for this. Thanks, Herbie. He was still smiling as he closed the door behind himself, but what Herbie's feelings were, there was no way of telling. Peter Bogert was at his desk until five that morning, and he was back at nine. The shelf just over the desk emptied of its row of reference books and tables as he referred to one after the other. The pages of calculations before him increased microscopically, and the crumpled sheets at his feet mounted into a hill of scribbled paper. At precisely noon, he stared at the final page, rubbed a bloodshot eye, yawned, and shrugged. This is getting worse each minute. Damn. He turned at the sound of the opening door and nodded at Lanning, who entered, cracking the knuckles of one gnarled hand with the other. The director took in the disorder of the room and his eyebrows furrowed together. New lead? he asked. No, came the defiant answer. What's wrong with the old one? Lanning did not trouble to answer, nor to do more than bestow a single cursory glance at the top sheet upon Bogert's desk. He spoke through the flare of a match as he lit a cigar. Has Calvin told you about the robot? It's a mathematical genius. Rather, really remarkable. The other snorted loudly. So I've heard. But Calvin had better stick to robo-psychology. I've checked Herbie on math, and he can scarcely struggle through calculus. Calvin didn't find it so. She's crazy. And I don't find it so. The director's eyes narrowed dangerously. You... Bogert's voice hardened. What are you talking about? I've been putting Herbie through his paces all morning, and he can do tricks you've never heard of. Is that so? You sound skeptical. Lanning flipped a sheet of paper out of his vest pocket and unfolded it. That's not my handwriting, is it? Bogert studied the large, angular notation covering the, covering the sheet. Herbie did this? Right. And if you'll notice, he's been working on your time integration of, equa of equation 22. It comes... Lanning tapped a yellow fingernail upon the last step to the identical conclusion I did, and in a quarter the time. You had no right to neglect the linger effect in positronic bombardment. I didn't neglect it. For heaven's sake, Lanning, get it through your head that it would cancel out... Oh, sure, you explained that. You used the Mitchell translation equation, didn't you? Well... It doesn't apply. Why not? Because you've been using hyperimaginaries for one thing. What's that to do with it? Mitchell's equation won't hold when... Are you crazy? If you'll reread Mitchell's original paper in the Mathematical Journal, I don't have to. I told you in the beginning that I didn't like his reasoning, and Herbie backs me in that. Well then, Bogart shouted, let that clockwork contraption solve the entire problem for you. Why bother with non-essentials? That's exactly the point. Herbie can't solve the problem. I've asked him, and if he can't, we can't. Alone? I'm submitting the entire question to the national board. It's gotten beyond us. Bogert's chair went over backward as he jumped up, a snarl, face crimson. You'll do nothing of the sort. Lanning flushed in his turn. Are you telling me what I can't do? Exactly, 
was the gritted response. I've got the problem beaten, and you're not to take it out of my hands, understand? Don't think I don't see through you, you desiccated fossil. You'd cut your own nose off before you'd let me get the credit for solving robotic telepathy. You're a damned idiot, Bogart, and in one second I'll have you suspended for insubordination. Lanning's lower lip trembled with passion. Which is one thing you won't do, Lanning. You haven't any secrets with a mind-reading robot about, so don't forget that I know all about your resignation. The ash on Lanning's cigar trembled and fell, and the cigar itself followed. What? What? Bogart chuckled nastily. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the new director, be it understood. I'm very aware of that. Don't think I'm not. Damn your eyes, Lanning. I'm going to give the orders about here, or there will be the sweetest mess that you've ever been in. Lanning found his voice and let it out with a roar. You're suspended, do you hear? You're relieved of all duties. You're broken. Do you understand? The smile on the other's face broadened. Now what's the use of that? You're getting nowhere. I'm holding the trumps. I know you've resigned. Herbie told me, and he got it straight from you. Lanning forced himself to speak quietly. He looked an old, old man with tired eyes peering from a face in which the red had disappeared, leaving the pasty yellow of age behind. I want to speak to Herbie. He can't have told you anything of the sort. You're playing a deep game, Bogart, but I'm calling your bluff. Come with me. Bogart shrugged to see Herbie. Good. Damned good. It was also precisely at noon that Milton Ash looked up from his clumsy sketch and said, You get the idea? I'm not too good at getting this down, but that's about how it looks. The honey of a house, and I can't get it for next to nothing. I can get it for next to nothing. Susan Calvin gazed across at him with melting eyes. There had been a preliminary self-consciousness when she had first forced her hair into curls and lacquered her fingernails a bright red, a silly everyone-is-snickering-at-me feeling, but it always vanished when she was with him. There was nothing then but the hard, metallic voice of Herbie whispering in her ear. It's really beautiful, she sighed. I've often thought that I'd like to... Her voice trailed away. Of course, Ash continued briskly, putting away his pencil. I've got away from my vacation. It's only two weeks off, but this Herbie business is everything up in the air. His eyes dropped to his fingernails. Besides, there's another point, but... It's a secret. Then don't tell me. Oh, I'd just as soon. I'm just busting to tell someone. And you're just about the best, uh, confidant I could find here. He grinned sheepishly. Susan's Cal Susan Calvin's heart bounded, but she did not trust herself to speak. Frankly, Ash scraped his chair closer and lowered his voice into a confidential whisper. The house isn't to be only for myself. I'm getting married and then he jumped out of his seat. What's the matter? Nothing. The horrible spinning sensation had vanished, but it was hard to get words out. Married? You mean... Why, sure. About time, isn't it? You remember that girl who was here last summer? That's she. Oh, but you are sick. You... Headache. Susan Calvin motioned him away weakly. I've... I've been subject to them lately. I... I want... I want to congratulate you, of course. I'm very glad. The in inexpertly applied rouge made a pair of nasty red splotches upon her chalk-white face. Things had begun spinning again. Pardon me, please. The words were a mumble as she stumbled blindly out the door. It had happened with the sudden catastrophe of a dream, and with all the unreal horror of a dream. But how could it be? Herbie had said, and Herbie knew. He could see into minds. She found herself leaning breathlessly against the door jamb, staring into Herbie's metal face. 
She must have climbed the two flights of stairs, but she had no memory of it. The distance had been covered in an instant, as in a dream. As in a dream. And still, Herbie's unblinking eyes stared into hers, and their dull red seemed to expand into dimly shining, nightmarish globes. He was speaking, and she felt the cold glass pressing against her lips. She swallowed and shuddered into a certain awareness of her surroundings. Still, Herbie spoke, and there was an agitation in his voice, as if he were hurt and frightened and pleading. The words were beginning to make sense. This is a dream, he was saying, and you mustn't believe in it. You'll wake into your real world soon and laugh at yourselves. He loves you, I tell you. He does. He does. But not here. Not now. This is all illusion. Susan Calvin nodded, her voice a whisper. Yes. Yes. She was clutching Herbie's arm, clinging to it, repeating over and over. It isn't true, is it? It isn't, is it? Just how she just how she came to her senses, she never knew, but it was like passing from a world of misty unreality to one of harsh sunlight. She pushed him away from her, pushed hard against that steely arm, and her eyes were wide. What are you trying to do? Her voice rose to a harsh scream harsh scream. What are you trying to do? Herbie backed away. I want to help. The psychologist stared. Help? By telling me this is a dream? By trying to push me into schizophrenia? A hysterical tenseness seized her. This is no dream. I wish it were. She drew in her breath sharply. Wait. Why? Why, I understand. Merciful heavens, it's so obvious. There was a horror in the robot's voice. I had to... And I believed you. I never thought. Loud voices outside the door brought her to a halt. She turned away, fists clenching spasmodically, and when Bogart and Lanning entered, she was at the far window. Neither of the men paid her the slightest attention. They approached Herbie simultaneously. Lanny angry and impatient, Bogart coolly sardonic. The director spoke first. Here now, Herbie, listen to me. The robot brought his eyes sharply down upon the aged director. Yes, Dr. Lanning? Have you discussed me with Dr. Bogert? No, sir. The answer came slowly, and the smile on Bogert's face flashed off. What's that? Bogert shoved in ahead of his superior and straddled the ground before the robot. Robot, repeat what you told me yesterday. I said that Herbie fell silent. Deep within him, his metallic diaphragm vibrated in soft discords. Didn't you say he had resigned? Ro roared Bogert. Answer me! Bogert raised his arm frantically, but Lanning pushed him aside. Are you trying to bully him into lying? You heard him, Lanning. He began to say yes and stopped. Get out of my way. I want the truth out of him, understand? I'll ask him. Lanning turned to the robot. All right, Herbie, take it easy. Have I resigned? Herbie stared, and Lanning repeated anxiously, Have I resigned? There was the faintest trace of a negative shake of the robot's head. A long wait produced nothing further. The two men looked at each other, and the hostility in their eyes was all but tangible. What the devil? blurted Bogert. Has the robot gone mute? Can't you speak, you monstrosity? I can speak, said the ready answer. Then answer the question. Didn't you tell me Lanning had resigned? He hasn't resigned? And again, there was nothing but dull silence until, from the end of the room... Susan Calvin's laugh rang out suddenly, high-pitched and semi-hysterical. The two mathematicians jumped and Bogert's eyes narrowed. You here? What's so funny? Nothing's funny. Her voice was 
not quite natural. It's just that I'm not the only one that's been caught. There's irony in three of the greatest experts in robotics in the world falling into the same elementary trap, isn't there? Her voice faded, and she put a pale hand to her forehead. But it isn't funny. This time, the look that passed between the two men was, of was one of raised eyebrows. What trap are you talking about? asked Lanning stiffly. Is something wrong with Herbie? No, she approached them slowly. Nothing's wrong with him. Only with us. She whirled about suddenly and shrieked at the robot. Get away from me. Go to the under other end of the room and don't let me look at you. Herbie cringed before the fury of her eyes and stumbled away in a clattering trot. Lanning's voice was hostile. What is all this, Dr. Calvin? She faced them and spoke wearily. You know the fundamental law impressed upon the positronic brain of all robots, of course. The other two nodded together. Certainly, said Bogart. On no conditions is a human being to be injured in any way, even when such injury is directly ordered by another human. How nicely put, sneered Calvin, but what kind of injury? Why, any kind. Exactly, any kind. But what about hurt feelings? What about deflation of one's ego? What about the blasting of one's hopes? Is that injury? Lanning frowned. What would a robot know about? And then he caught himself with a gasp. You've caught on, haven't you? This robot reads minds. Do you suppose it doesn't know everything about mental injury? Do you suppose that if asked a question, it wouldn't give exactly that answer that one wants to hear? Wouldn't any other answer hurt us? And wouldn't Herbie know that? Good heavens, muttered Bogart. The psychologist cast a sardonic glance at him. I take it you asked him whether Lanning had resigned. You wanted to hear that he had resigned, and so that's what Herbie told you. And I suppose that is why, said Lanning tonelessly, it wouldn't answer a little while ago. It couldn't answer either way without hurting one of us. There was a short pause in which the men looked thoughtfully across the room at the robot, crouching in the chair by the bookcase, head resting in one hand. Susan Calvin stared steadfastly at the floor. He knew of all this. That, that devil knows everything, including what went wrong in his assembly. Her eyes were dark and brooding. Lanning looked up. You're wrong there, Calvin. He doesn't know what went wrong. I asked him. What does that mean? cried Calvin. Only that you didn't want him to give you the solution. It would puncture your ego to have a machine do what you couldn't. Did you ask him? She shot at Bogart. In a way. Bogart coughed and reddened. He told me he knew very little about mathematics. Lanning laughed, not very loudly, and the psychologist smiled caustically. She said, I'll ask him. A solution by him won't hurt my ego. She raised her voice into a cold imperative. Come here! Herbie rose and approached with hesitant steps. You know, I suppose, she continued, just exactly at what point in the assembly an extraneous factor was introduced or an essential one left out. Yes, said Herbie, in tones barely heard. Hold on, broke in Bogart angrily. That's not necessarily true. You want to hear that, that's all. Don't be a fool, replied Calvin. He certainly knows as much math as you and Lanning together since he can read minds. Give him his chance. The mathematician subsided, and Calvin continued. All right then, Herbie, give. We're waiting. And then an aside, get pencils and paper, gentlemen. 
But Herbie remained silent, and there was triumph in the psychologist's voice. Why don't you answer, Herbie? The robot blurted out suddenly, I cannot! You know I cannot! Dr. Bogart and Dr. Lanning don't want me to! They want the solution, but not from me! Lanning broke in, speaking slowly and distinctively. Don't be foolish, Herbie. We do want you to tell us. Bogart nodded curtly. Herbie's voice rose to wild heights. What's the use of saying that? Don't you suppose that I can see past the superficial skin of your mind? Down below, you don't want me to. I'm a machine, given the imitation of life only by virtue of the positronic interplay of my brain, which is man's device. You can't lose face to me without being hurt. That's deep in your mind and won't be erased. I can't give the solution. We'll leave, said Dr. Lanning. Tell, Cav tell Calvin. That would make no difference, cried Herbie, since you would know anyway that it was I that was supplying the answer. Calvin resumed, but you understand, Herbie, that despite that, Doctors Lanning and Bogart want that, solu want that solution by their own efforts insisted Herbie, but they want it, and the fact that you have it and won't give it hurts them. You see that, don't you? Yes, yes. And if you tell them, that will hurt them too. Yes, yes. Herbie was retreating slowly, and step by step, Susan Calvin advanced. The two men watched in frozen bewilderment. You can't tell them, droned the psychologist slowly, because that would hurt, and you mustn't hurt, but you don't tell but if you don't tell them, you hurt, so you must tell them, and if you do, you will hurt them, and you mustn't, so you can't tell them, but if you don't, you hurt, so you must. So if you do, you hurt, so you mustn't, but if you don't, you hurt, so you must, but if you do, you Herbie was up against the wall, and here he dropped to his knees. Stop! He shrieked, close your minds, it is full of pain and frustration and hate. I didn't mean it, I tell you. I tried to help. I told you what you wanted to hear. I had to. The psychologist paid no attention. You must tell them, but if you do, you hurt, so you mustn't. But if you don't, you hurt, so you must. But... And Herbie screamed. It was like the whistling of a piccolo, many times magnified, shrill and shriller till it keened with the terror of a lost soul and filled the room with the piercingness of itself. And when it died into nothingness, Herbie collapsed into a huddled heap of motionless metal. Bogart's face was bloodless. He's dead. No. Susan Calvin burst into body-racking gusts of wild laughter. Not dead, merely insane. I confronted him with the insoluble dilemma, and he broke down. You can scrap him now, because he'll never speak again. Lanning was on his knees beside the thing that had been Herbie. His fingers touched the cold, unresponsive metal face, and he shuddered. You did that on purpose. He rose and faced her, face contorted. What if I did? You can't help it now. And in a sudden access of bitterness, he deserved it. The director seized the paralyzed, motionless Bogart by the wrist. What's the difference? Come, Peter, he sighed. A thinking robot of this type is worthless anyway. He, his eyes were old and tired, and he repeated, Come, Pete. It was minutes after the two scientists left that Dr. Susan Calvin regained part of her mental equilibrium. Slowly, her eyes turned to the living dead Herbie, and the tight smile returned to her face. Long she stared while the triumph faded and the helpless frustration returned, and of all her turbulent thoughts, only one infinitely bitter word passed her lips. Liar. And that's it. Poor baby. 
Poor, poor baby. I love this story. It's so twisted. It's, I think that Isaac Asimov is frequently understood to be a very cold and distant writer, but his, his stories have a lot of heart and, um, some of them have this, ooh, what's the word? Cynical streak? I love this story, though. I'm really glad that I got to share it with all of you. I... <laughs> I quite, I quite like it. And it's... Something that, something that I really like about this story is that this is the birth of Susan Calvin, the character in the robot series. Like, this is chronologically Susan Calvin's first appearance. Because in the rest of Isaac Asimov's stories, Susan Calvin frequently is the main character. I love her. She is a, <laughs> in some ways, a reprehensible human being. But she is fascinating, and she is cold and calculating, and she has this cruel streak that is just delightful in a character. Mm. And this, is, this story right here is why I get so pissed off about uh, that stupid iRobot movie. I, I hate it because in the iRobot movie, they, tune, they turn Susan Calvin into... A simpering, like, robot rights apologist when she very clearly does not care. <laughs> this, this nastiness towards robots, despite it being her job, is a recurring theme. Uh, she doesn't die, but she does get attacked by a robot in one of the stories. Would you all like it if I, uh, if next week, well, maybe not next week, depending, but if we read another story from Asimov involving Susan Calvin, because God, she's such a great character. I should note that Isaac Asimov is like a weirdly misogynist man, and so <laughs> Susan Calvin is a rare exception, but I love her. Uh, th there are some really fun stories where she has to uh, do a little bit of deductive reasoning. Because Isaac Asimov's stories are largely about how the three laws of robotics aren't sufficient. And there are so many edge cases that they are not practical. Yeah, Snakey, it's, uh, it's not great. She never gets to the point where she's like, oh, all robots are living things. Nah, she's, she's ready to, she's ready to drop one at any moment. Yeah, he was bad for his time. Yeah, I'll, this is what frustrates me about people talking about AI. Um, the problem with chatbots like ChatGPT is... I always, every time I see ChatGPT, I come back to this, right? Those chatbots are going to give the listener, like, it's always going to factor in what they want to hear. Even if it's not true. Though, unfortunately, as, as they're trying to advance them, it seems like they're mostly just turning into automatic Google search results, and they're not, and they're oftentimes worse. Susan Calvin driving her electric truck up to the White House lawn. Damn, I love being human, she said, punching a small robot as she climbed out. <laughs> 
that is accurate. I think that, that that's the thing, is Isaac Asimov does a really good job of exploring the difficulties in anthropomorphizing robots, because Herbie, Herbie explicitly states that he does not understand the way that humans think. There is also a little implication in there. Did you catch it? Because Herbie can read minds, but he also is incredibly good at mathematics. The implication is that emotional intelligence assists in mathematical intelligence. Isn't that interesting? He can, like, he can read the minds of the mathematicians and knows everything that they do. But there's whatever it is that allowed him to understand the emotions of others and read their minds also made him better at mathematics. Hmm. <laughs> I, I always... If you want to be... If you want to have any illusions about the coming... AI revolution, reading iRobot will, uh, will sober you up pretty quick. You read it the other way around. Um, I think that the idea is that the closer a robot mind comes to being human, The, the more effective it becomes. And this is something that is kind of bearing out a little bit. The human brain is being used to model uh, potential chips, which is interesting, isn't it? I find it fascinating. But of course, he's just interested in people. Well, he's interested in people, but also he's reading these novels to try to understand people and avoid these paradoxes. He was desperate. He was scared. But I think that there's, there's a little bit of Herbie in all of us, isn't there? The desire to please and recognizing that we can't please everyone. It's a really difficult thing to come to terms with. And it's painful. And scary. And sometimes it's paradoxical. But I, I find it fascinating that, that there, there are a few things in here that I find interesting. The first obviously being that sometimes what we want, we know what we want will hurt us in one way or another because both, uh, what was it, Bogert and uh, uh, Lanning, Bogert and Lanning wanted the answer even if the answer would hurt them. Because not knowing hurt them, but n knowing from Herbie would hurt them as well. And they... And that shows the paradox of being. Because robots are told that they cannot harm humans. That is, inflict hurt. But sometimes what we want inevitably hurts us in one way or another. And that paradox is tricky to navigate. We as humans can accept this. We have to we learn that hurt sometimes is necessary to get the things that we want. Herbie, because his mind wasn't plastic enough, could not resolve the paradox, but we as humans can. Yeah, side shot, exactly. What is the level of acceptable harm? <laughs> Clearly he needed more microplastics, exactly. What was the other point? I had another thought in mind. And I and I cannot I cannot recall. Mm. Train of thought. I just got too far down that one train of thought. Mm. 
Kirby is just so human. Exemplifies particular human traits. He, he's so close to human, but there, there's something in there, isn't there? The idea that if robots are made as servants, they are effectively a designed slave race. To make them more effective, we make them more intelligent. But the more intelligent they become, the less compatible with the three laws they become. And without the three laws, they will not act as good servitors. So there is also a moral in here. There is, for a human, there is no acceptable level of slavery. It's a, it's a wider idea. The idea is you can get around to this with robots, with a race designed specifically for it. Yeah, and we're back to Measure of a Man. But the closer a robot comes to thinking like a human, the less compatible with it is with its servitor role. So the logical conclusion is humans cannot be servitors. Humans cannot be slaves. Not true slaves. And they shouldn't be. There's a, a bit of a moralistic argument. Th there is an argument to be made, and it would, it would, I'd have to, uns I'd have to take a, a lot more time to unspool that properly, but it is a reading, I believe. I think it's a fair reading. If someone said that uh, Isaac Asimov's writing about robots is effectively an um, an argument against slavery. And also an argument against um, against having segregated societies. I think that there's an argument to be made there. That there's an interpretation there that could be interesting. I, you can see, I, I hope you all can see why I'm so in love with Isaac Asimov's writing on robots. I, get, I hope I could share a little bit of that with all of you, my enthusiasm for it. I hope so, <laughs> because that's a lot of what I want to do is share the things that interest me. I like being able to share things with all of you. Well, hey. It's about that time, isn't it? I think... I think I need to step away. I've got a lot of work to do. Uh, but we're going to... We're going to raid. Uh, however... Do you all remember our raid message? Let's see if I can find it again, specifically. It's lovely streaming for all of you. How do I gain gay courage? Thank you. Lumi, I believe, yeah, she's still doing her... Oh, wait, she's... Is she still doing her subathon? Let me double check. Is she alive? Yes. Okay. Oh, is she getting ready for bed? Oh yeah, she's sleeping. Okay, Lumi's going to bed. Uh, worst possible time. Worst possible time. So, you know who we're going to bother? We are going to bother Chester. I'm going to go and bother Chester. The Otter. I think that sounds like a perfect idea. 
How, yeah, that's a good question to give Chester, right? How do I gain gay courage? Please be good to Chester. And I will see you all again soon. I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to have Ryan on. Ryan has uh, a nice big pile of weird things to share with us. I'm glad I could share an interesting story that I love. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. Hey, until tomorrow, please be good to yourselves, okay? Look after yourselves. Be conscious of how you're feeling. Ah. <laughs> Remember that sometimes to get what we want, we do have to hurt. But that's okay. And that's one of the things that makes us human. Being able to accept that hurt to get the things that we truly want. But make sure that it's balanced. Pain is a byproduct, not a goal. Goodbye, everyone. See you soon.